Oh, Cyrus family, how blessed of God we are again to gather, to fellowship in his word. We definitely have our heartfelt condolences for the Gibson family over the transition of Reverend Gibson. Please continue to keep them in prayer uh, during this season. We're praying God's peace and comfort during this time. We're also praying for you as well. We miss you all, and we're praying that God guides us through this so we can meet again together in the house of prayer. Let's say a quick prayer, then we'll get started with our study for today. God, thank you for another privilege to fellowship in your word. Thank you for how you continue to bless us with your grace and mercy. Pray now, God, as we study your word, you would show us those things you'd have us to see. Speak those things you would have us to hear. Teach us those things you want us to learn so we can be who you've called us to be. More importantly, do what you've called us to do. Even now, Lord, sit Michael down. Let them see and hear Jesus, not me. Let everything be said and done for your glory, for us in Jesus' name. Amen. For our time together today, I want to look at Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 20. Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 20. As we just celebrated this past Sunday, we celebrated the Lord's Supper. It's a commemoration of the death and burial of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we partake of the elements of it speaks to the body and blood of Jesus Christ. But do we really understand what that means? Do we really understand the symbolism that comes from taking part in the Lord's Supper? That's what I want to look at today for our lesson. Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 20. In the English Standard Version, it reads, And when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. We like to eat. There's no way to get around it. Meals for us have significance. When you look at the different holidays, the different events we have annually, many of them center around the food. You always talk about Thanksgiving dinner. With wedding receptions, you're always trying to figure out who's going to be the caterer and what meals are going to take place there. Even at family reunion, we're trying to figure out who's barbecuing, who's making the sides, who's fixing the desserts. Meals in our culture have significance. And that same premise is true even in ancient culture as we discover in the text where Jesus here has called his disciples to the Passover meal. It is in celebration of what takes place in Exodus chapter 12 where the last plague against Egypt, God tells Moses and tells the people, I need you to kill a lamb without spot or blemish. Get the blood of that lamb and place it over the doorpost of your home. And as I send the death angel, as long as that blood is posted on the door, I will pass over you. It was a reminder of how God delivered the children of Israel out of the hands of Egypt. So annually, they would celebrate that moment to where God allowed a Passover to happen in the life of Israel. And here, Jesus is calling his disciples to celebrate that Passover, but he brings it to full context to show what happened in Egypt was only a preview of what I'm going to do at Calvary, where I will shed my blood, allowing the death angel to pass over you because you are covered by my blood. It's a commemoration of how the Lord delivers his children. And it's important that we remember that as we come to the table, because a lot of times when we're taking the juice and we're taking the cracker, we just do it haphazardly, but don't think about the real meaning, the real significance of why we come to the table. We don't think about what does it mean for me to partake of the Lord's body and his blood? What does it mean when we commit 
Lord's Supper. That's what I want us to think about at this time, especially during Holy Week as we celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That as we think about the Lord's Supper, we remember Jesus and his sacrifice at Calvary. That it's not just something we do on First Sunday where we dress up in black and white, we sing particular hymns, and we read particular scriptures just because we have to do it. But that we think about every time we come to the table together to eat of the bread and to drink of the cup, we solemnly remember Jesus and his sacrifice at Calvary. So why should we remember the Lord's Supper? Why should we remember the table? First reason why, according to the text, is because it reminds us of the Lord's desire for fellowship. It reminds us of the Lord's desire for fellowship. Notice in verses 14, 15, and 16, as Jesus is coming to the table, he reclined at the table and tells his apostles, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Notice the phrasing that's used by Luke that Jesus has this earnest desire, this passion to fellowship with his disciples in this moment of Passover. Note in the previous verses the details that Jesus expressed and the details that Jesus puts in getting this meal together. In verse 7 through 13, it says, Then the day of the unleavened bread came, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So watch this. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. They say to him, Where will you have us prepared? He said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters, and tell the master of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. Jesus gave the disciples specific instructions and details on who they needed to talk to, where they needed to go, and he already knew this large upper room would be furnished for them to gather together and fellowship. Jesus has this earnest desire to fellowship with his disciples because it's now a moment when you look at the table where God and where man commune together under the celebration of a sacrifice. It's symbolic of what Christ does for us at Calvary to where he reconciles us back to God, brings God and man back together to the table and say, let's get together again. Why is this important? It's important because when we realize our sin, sin broke off our fellowship with God. Sin broke our fellowship with God. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 8, after Adam and Eve fell into sin because they ate of the forbidden fruit. The Bible says they sowed fig leaves and they hid from the presence of God. That's a tragedy of sin, not just because it costs us so much, but it causes us to think that we can get away from God's presence, that we can hide from God's presence. It breaks off our fellowship with God. That's why sin is really dangerous. Not just because it costs us so much, but we can't fellowship with God. We can't get close to God while we're in sin. And every time sin occurs, God performs an act of separation. That's what happens in Genesis chapter 3. After God condemns everyone in the garden, he condemned Adam, he condemned Eve, he condemned the serpent. He kicked them out of the garden and told them they can no longer be there. Sin is dangerous again because it separates us from God's fellowship. And every time sin is present, God has an act of separation. We even see that at the cross in Matthew chapter 27, where Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The reason why God forsook Jesus at the cross is because he was carrying the sins of all humanity. Sin cannot live in the presence of God. That's why sin is so deadly and so dangerous, because it removes us from God's presence. But because of what Jesus did at Calvary, we now have a chance to come back into fellowship with God. The cross restores our fellowship between God and man. And that's what Paul tells the Romans in Romans chapter 5 and 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, 
much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Because of what Jesus does at Calvary, it gives us a chance to come back to the table, come back to the Father and be in fellowship with him. And not only fellowship now, but fellowship in eternity. That after all this is over with, when we've prayed our last prayer and sung our last hymn, we still have a chance to be in fellowship with God for eternity. Revelation 19 reminds us of that, that we'll be at the marriage supper of the Lamb, that great feast, that great getting up morning. We will be able to fellowship with God in eternity because of what Jesus Christ did at the cross. So every time we come to the table, when you take up the Lord's body and blood, keep in mind we are reminded that God wanted us to fellowship with him so much that he sent his son to die for us that we can be reconciled back to him. But it not only reminds us of the fellowship that needs to be reconnected to God and man, it also speaks to the fellowship we have between one another. Note in verse 17, Jesus took the cup and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. He does the same thing in verse number 19. He takes bread and gives thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples. Now, this is significant when you look at what they are sharing. They're partaking of the cup, which is representative of the Lord's blood. And they're partaking of the bread, which is symbolic of the Lord's body. This is the one moment where the disciples are united together under the umbrella that they're celebrating the death and burial of Jesus Christ. It speaks to the fact that the reason why Christ went to the cross is not only to reconcile God and man, but to bring us back together as humanity. Because not only did sin break off fellowship with God, sin broke off fellowship with one another. As crazy as that sounds, our sin causes us to be divided amongst ourselves in humanity. If you don't believe me, ask Cain and Abel. After sin creeps into the Garden of Eden, in Genesis chapter 4, we see the first homicide committed in mankind because Cain got envious and jealous of his brother Abel, and he kills his own brother. Sin breaks off fellowship between all of us, and we don't need Bible for that. That's life, because we deal with the fruits of sin that causes us to be divided. Racism is a fruit of sin that causes division among us. Classism, to where we have a upper class, a middle class, and lower class of economic disparity. That is because of sin that causes us to be divided. Sexism, all different kinds of disparities and hatred are a result of sin that has caused us to be divided against each other. To where we will have all different acts of violence, all different acts of crime because we just can't get along. And we're dealing with the fruits of sin because of that. But because of what Jesus Christ did at Calvary, it not only reunited us with God, it reunited humanity together. That Christ died for us to come together under the umbrella called the church. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 6 reminds us, here's the mystery of the gospel. That the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. That Christ literally died in order for us to come back together as the church. And I know in this age of social distancing, we feel like we can't fellowship because everyone needs to be six feet apart. Everyone needs to be quarantined. But fellowship is not based on location. Fellowship is based on relationship with God. I may not agree with your politics, I may not agree with your economic status. I may not agree with anything else you have going on. But if we have common ground to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he was born, he lived, died, was buried, and rose again, that is enough to bring us together that we can put aside our differences and come together as a people called the church. Not just the United States, not just the United Nations. We can come together as a church because Christ is able to bring us together because of his blood. That's why when we come to, to the table, we need to be excited that we're fellowshipping with one another. 
that we're not doing this by ourselves. We all are partaking of the Lord's body and his blood together because we have the same common belief that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. So when we think about the table, we have to think about God's desire for fellowship, that he wants us to be reconciled back to God, and he wants us to be reconciled back to each other. That's what we should remember when we come to the table. That's why the old hymn said, blessed be the ties that bind. Our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. That's what we should consider when we come to the table. God's desire for fellowship. But also when we come to the table, we need to be reminded of the Lord's act of salvation. Note in verses 19 and 20, and he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This bread that Jesus breaks is symbolic of his body that is given not only for the disciples then, but disciples now. It speaks to this premise of this Old Testament idea of sacrifice, where they had to use bulls and goats for atonement. The only problem with that is those sacrifices were temporary. They only had to give them once a year, but it only covered sins for a year. So if you sin after the sacrifice, you needed another sacrifice to pay for atonement. And typically with us, it doesn't take much for us to sin because we constantly have that thought process over and over and over again. If it were just up to us by ourselves, we would always choose sin because sin is in our nature. So what Jesus does is remove the temporary sacrifice and say, listen, I'm providing my body as a permanent sacrifice to pay for your ultimate price of sin. I'm giving you my body as a sacrifice. The prophet Isaiah reminds us of that in Isaiah chapter 53 and 5. I know we use this scripture for physical healing, but it really is speaking to the spiritual healing of our bodies. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace on him and by his stripes, we are spiritually healed. He gives his body for us as a permanent sacrifice, and we don't need another bull. We don't need another goat. We don't need another sheep. Christ paid it all, and that one moment at Calvary is all we need to be saved from sin. Hebrews 9 and 26 reminds us, but as it is, he has appeared once for all by putting away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Jesus paid it all by giving his body for our sins. But not only that, not only says, this is my body given for you. In verse 20, he also speaks to this cup, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Here, Christ is talking about this blood covenant that establishes atonement for our sins. The same premise of bulls and goats being used in the Old Testament, they had to use that blood as a means of atonement for their sins. Christ said, listen, I'm establishing a new covenant with you that my blood that is poured out for you will not only cover you now in salvation, but it will cover you in eternity until I redeem you back to myself. That Christ's blood saves us and seals us to the day of redemption. That's why when we come to the table, we shouldn't take it lightly. We should remember God's desire for fellowship. And we should also remember God's plan for salvation. That he gave his body and his blood to save us from our sins. Let's pray. God, thank you for reminding us what it means to come to the table. Thank you for reminding us of this meal that we should remember. That as we partake of your body and blood, as we commemorate your death, it reminds us that we were broken off of fellowship because of our sin. But you reconciled us back to you because of your son, Jesus Christ. That we can come together as the church, united under the premise that we believe in your son, Jesus Christ. It reminds us of his great sacrifice that he gave his body. He shed his blood for our sins. Let us keep that thought in mind every time that we come to celebrate the table. That we can't forget what you've done for us. In Jesus' name.